story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet on both radio and television. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a burglary detail. For more than two months, a wave of safe burglaries has been sweeping your city. Apparently, it's the work of professionals. The jobs are well-planned, well-executed. There's no lead to the whereabouts of the suspects. Your job, get them. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. Yes, compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One, Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs. 21% longer than standard cigarette size. Fatima gives you more for your money. And in king-size Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Buy Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Sunday, June 8th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary division. Safe detail. My partner's Bill Lockwood. The boss is Captain Wisdom. My name's Friday. I was on the way back to the office, and it was 8.36 a.m. when I got to room 45, burglary division. Joe? Oh, hi, Smith. There's a note in the book for us from the captain about your partner, Lockwood. Yeah, what's that? Forgot to make that sick report on him yesterday. Did you call him? How's his leg? I talked to him on the phone last night. Pretty bad ankle sprain. Doctor figures he'll be out for a couple of weeks anyway. Who's the fellow you got there? Suspect Jones and McCready picked up on stakeout, drugstore, 3rd and Ventura. What do you got on him? Creedy says they picked him up about quarter to five this morning. He and Jones were staked out inside the drugstore. Saw this fellow drive up in a car, get out and try the front door of the place. Uh And he went around and back the place, tried the back door. Then he came around in front again, tried to jimmy the door. Finally gave up, got in his car and started to drive off. Jones and McCready followed him, picked him up and brought him in. Where's Jones and McCready now, do you know? I told him to go ahead home. No reason for him to hang around. We'd carry the thing from here. What have you done so far? Did you check him through R&I yet? Call Frank Cunningham. He's doing it now. What's his name? According to his identification, it's Charles W. Boyd, an address at 239 West 92nd Street. That's what he tells us, anyway. Mm-hmm. Is that your name, fella? Yeah, that's my name. Saw my identification, no reason for me to lie. You can check me out. All right. Hold your hand up there. We'll get these cuffs off of you. Yeah, sure. All right, there you are. Uh, yeah, thanks. Sure tired sitting here, handcuffed, sitting in one place. Frank, you want to tell Gaffney we'll be down in the interrogation room when R and I calls back, tell him to transfer it in there, would you? Yeah, okay, I'll meet you there. All right, thanks. All right, boy, let's go. I can talk to you down the hall. Yeah, let's get this thing over with. I don't feel good. I want to get out of here. What are you shaking for? There's nothing to get nervous about. He was sick. Yeah, I haven't been feeling good at all the last couple of days. <laughs> hey, wouldn't you know it? I was smokes. Hey, say, would you happen to have a cigarette, please? Yeah. Here you are. Thanks. There's a light for you. Yeah, I got it, thanks. All right, turn around a minute, will you? Let me look at your eyes. Huh? Turn around. All right, let's go. It's okay, Joe. I told Gaffney you'll put through the call from our night. Oh, that's fine. Are you sure this won't take long? Huh? I'd like to get out of here and get home. I've been sick for a week. I ought to be in bed right now. We'll make it as fast as we can. All right, in here. Have a chair, Boyd. Yeah. All right, mister. You say you're not feeling well, you're tired, you want to go home. So are we. We've been working all night. Now, how about getting to the bottom of this thing? Oh, sure, I'm all for it. Try to explain to the guys who picked me up. I don't know what it's all about. Ask me anything you want. Now, let's start it here, Boyd. What were you doing out there hanging around that drugstore at quarter to five this morning? It's the same thing I told the other officers. I was sick. I wanted to get something for my nerves. 
Jumpy as a cat, I couldn't sleep. And then when the drugstore was closed, that was pretty obvious, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right, it was. I just drove up there, tried the door, and then I saw the joint was closed, so I left. That's all there is to it, just what I told the other No, officer. that's not true, Boyd, and you know it isn't. You hung around the store for more than ten minutes. You tried the front door, and you waited a couple of minutes. You went around to the back. You tried to get in back there. You couldn't make it, so you came around front again. You tried to jimmy the front door, didn't you? No, no, that's not it. You got it all wrong. How about this, Boyd? This your crowbar? Yeah, what about it? Just a car tool used to fix flat tires. Carry it around all the time in the car. You carry it on you? No, not all the time. I just happen to have it, that's all. Now, look, boy, that's not going to get it. The officers that picked you up saw you using this bar in the door of that drugstore. I thought you were willing to get on to facts. You were going to square with us. How about it? Sure, sure, I'll square with you. I wanted to get over as much as you do. Just tell me what you want to know. All we want is the truth. This address on your ID, the one you gave us, is that your true address? You living there now? Yeah, that's right. Check it out if you want. I'm not lying. No reason to lie. We think there is. This address of yours is just about 10 miles away from where you were picked up. Now you tell us how much sense it makes driving 10 miles to a drugstore at 4.30 in the morning. Well, I had to. I was sick. It was the only place open. You're lying and you know it, mister. You had to pass at least two all-night drugstores on the way. Why couldn't you stop at one of those? I didn't see any stores open. I was sick. I just kept driving until I spotted a place I thought was open. Looked to me like it was open. A lot of lights in the window inside the store, too. I didn't know it was closed till I tried the door. You usually try doors with a crowbar, boy? Oh, look, look, what are you getting at? You, you think I was trying to break in that place? Yeah, that's what we think. Well, what for? What do I want to break in there? I, I wanted to get something for my nerves, that's all. I wanted to find a drugstore. Why should I break open a place and j just get a bottle of medicine? Huh? We don't think you were looking for medicine, Boyd. Well, then what was it? Well, what do you figure? This is what we figure, mister. You were going in that store to burglarize the safe. The area is the same, the time element's right, so is the type of business. The M.O. matches right down the line. I don't know what you're talking about. Six safe jobs in the last two months. The same time element, the same general area. Drug stores, liquor stores, and markets. What about it? I don't know what you're talking about. It's the truth. I'm not a burglar. You got me wrong. I never touched a safe in my life. How many times you been arrested, mister? Huh? How many times you been arrested? Well, a couple of times I've been picked up. Nothing serious, though, so help me. It's the truth. I never touched a safe in my whole life. It's not going to do much good lying to us, boy. We'll get everything we need from records. Well, I got a record. I ain't denying that, but I'm no burglar. Then what were you doing at quarter of five this morning trying to get in that drugstore if you're not a burglar? I tried to explain to you. I wasn't trying to break in. I needed some medicine, something for my nerves. I thought the place was open. I'm a sick man. I swear on a Bible officer. That's just the way it was. I get it. Yeah, Friday talking. Oh, yeah, kind of. Charles Boyd, yeah, that's right. Mm hmm, that's him. What do you got? Uh huh. All the same. I see. Give me the last two arrests. No, the last two arrests again. Yeah. May 9th, May 22nd. All right, Cunningham. Yeah, thanks very much. Frank, you got that folder there, those crime reports? Yeah, here you are. What do you have to say? Boyd was in custody May 9th, May 22nd. What was he in on? Narcotics. He's a user. Long record. It's all the same, though. Never been picked up for anything but narcotics. Just about rules him out, huh? Ninth and the 22nd. If he was in jail, he couldn't have had anything to do with those last two judges. Yeah, it's about the size of it. You got it straight now, huh? I told you, you thought I was lying, didn't you? I'm no burglar. You, you know what my record is. I never touched a safe in my life. Just checking it out, Boyd. Sometimes it happens this way. Sure. No hard feelings. I take off now and go home. I'm not feeling well at all. I I guess it's okay if No, I you go. just sit still, Boyd. You're not going yet. What do you mean? Red tab on your card down at the record bureau. Your last arrest, May 22nd, violation of State Narcotics Act. You went out on a $1,500 bail. Yeah, that's right. It was all legal. I paid for it. Why didn't you show up for your preliminary hearing? We got a bench warrant for your arrest. Oh, no, they wouldn't do that to me, would they? I was sick in bed. I couldn't make it to court. You just look at me. You can tell, can't you? I ought to be in bed. Yeah, you don't look good at all. Of course I don't. I'm a sick man, really sick. I ought to be in a hospital. Well, maybe that's where they'll send you. <laughs> We continued questioning the suspect, Charles Boyd, who finally admitted that he'd gone to the drugstore early that morning for the purpose of burglarizing the place to obtain narcotics. He told us it was his first attempt at burglary, and further interrogation proved beyond a doubt he had nothing to do with the current wave of safe burglaries. He was booked on the bench warrant, and narcotics detail was notified of his arrest. For all practical purposes, we were right back where we'd started from two months before when the campaign of safe jobs first started. Boyd was just another in a long line of possible suspects who had to be tracked down and checked out. In the final analysis, they meant nothing to the case, but tracking them down and checking them out meant long hours of legwork, days, even weeks, and then more hours spent interrogating them. Boyd typified the possible suspect. He added nothing, but he couldn't be ignored. In the weeks that followed, stakeouts continued in the general area where the safe burglaries had been operating. No further leads. 
The investigation went on. On June 17th, Frank Smith and I drove out to the San Fernando Valley to check a lead on a possible suspect we'd gotten from one of our informants. His information was that the possible suspect, an ex-convict by the name of Mark Chandler, who'd served time for burglary, had apparently come into some money recently. Through the parole office, we located Chandler on a chicken ranch just outside of Van Nuys. Yeah, I've been out here almost three months now. Nice life. Pretty hard work, though. Got a few routine questions for you, Mark. Like we told you, we're from burglary detail. Uh, I guess you know why we're out here. Yeah, I think I get the idea. I admit there was a time when you wouldn't be very welcome, but right now it's different. Anything I can do to help, it's all right, fellas. We're going to lay it right on the table for you, Mark. You own this place, do you? Yeah, that's right. Me and my brother. Where'd the money come from? My brother. He set the whole thing up. You say you and your brother. Whose money bought the place, Mark? Well, my brother made the down payment. You can check on it. The whole deal went through escrow right down here at the local bank. What's the deal, anyway? Didn't you check with my parole officer? Yeah, we checked with Galloway. He told us you were still on active parole. You were running a chicken ranch. Didn't say it was for your brother, though. Well, I thought I filled him in on it. I didn't have enough cash to swing the deal. My brother put up most of the dough. I only had 800 bucks. Uh-huh. That's your car back there in the driveway, Mark? No, that's my brother's. Nice one, huh? Yeah. I got permission from the parole officer to drive. Say, would you mind walking back with me to the Brooder Shack? I got a new batch of Rhode Islands in this morning. Day-old chicks. Got to be sure the heat's right. Yeah, all right. There's a lot of work around a place like this. I, I just built those pens there. Uh-huh. They're nice. Good-looking flock of chicks there, wouldn't you say? Four weeks old. Uh, those are barred rocks. You notice how they're starting to feather out already, getting nice and heavy? Make wonderful fryers, you know. Oh, that's so? Oh, yeah. Uh, just a minute. Hey, will you look at that mash rack? They like fiends. I just filled that thing an hour ago. That's where the money goes. You know that mash goes for better than five bucks a sack? Uh, look, we don't want to take too much of your time, Chandler. We can see you're busy. We've got a couple of dates we'd like to check with you, where you were, what you did. Oh, sure, fellas. Uh, just let me check the temperature in the brooder house here. It won't take a minute. Hey, uh, come on in. All right. Uh, pretty cute when they're small, huh? Uh, let me see here. Just look at that, huh, Joe? Piled all over each other. Must be more than a thousand of them. Yeah, at least. Uh, yeah, just right. 89. Gotta watch them pretty close the first week. Fell up the road, lost a big batch last week. Heating element in the brooder went out overnight. Oh, yeah, gotta shove that door hard. Sticks a little. Yeah, I'll get it. Okay, what else was it, officers? Glad to help you any way I can. Those dates we want to check, Mark. It was almost a month ago, the week ending May 7th. Yeah. Can you account for your time on that weekend, where you were, what you did? The 7th? Yeah, let's see. Yeah, I was here. You any way of proving that? Yeah, I think so. I started here the 23rd of April. Been here every night since. Anyone we can check with on that? Well, my brother and his wife, they were here, they can tell you. Neighbors, too. They come over for cards on the weekends. It, come to think of it, I remember my parole officer was out to see me one of those weekends. I'm pretty sure of it. You can check with him. All right, Mark. Thanks. Hey, what's the pitch anyway, Sergeant? The safe jobs around town, is that it? That's it. You heard anything, Mark? Any rumbles at all? No, sorry. This job keeps me pretty close to home. I don't get around at all. Maybe two, three nights a month. That's the only time I get out. That's all we're asking about. Before we left the suspect, Mark Chandler, we called his parole officer, and he substantiated the fact that he'd visited with Chandler on the night of May 7th, the date of one of the safe burglaries. We checked with his brother, his sister-in-law, and the neighbors, and all of them fully corroborated his story. Before we left, we were satisfied that Chandler had nothing to do with the safe burglaries. It was just another of the more than half a hundred possibles that we'd checked out in the course of the investigation. On June 22nd, we got a lead on still another one. It came from the proprietor of a fix-it shop on West Pico Boulevard near Normandy. We drove out to interview him. He gave his name as Harold Van Owen. Yeah, just a minute, officers. Be with you in a minute, all right? Yeah, okay. Have to get these keys made. The lady will be back soon. Says she needs them. What time you got, Frank? 10 to 12. Getting hungry? Well, I didn't have much breakfast. How about dropping by Felipe's, all right? So it's me. I could use a good French dip sandwich. Haven't been down there for a while. Yeah. All right, officers. Sorry to keep you waiting. I had to get the keys done. I promised the woman. That's all right, Mr. Van Owen. Well, what was it you wanted to see us about? Well, I don't know, to tell the truth. Maybe it's something, maybe it's nothing at all. I just don't know. Figured I ought to let somebody know about it, though. Yes, sir? A young fellow was in here the day before yesterday. Said his name was Ralph McKinley. Told me he lived around the neighborhood, but I don't think I ever saw him before. He didn't act right to me. Mm-hmm. Said he's an inventor. 
I doubt it, though. He just didn't look the part to me. Young fellow, you know, dress is pretty flashy. Never met an inventor that looked like that before. Well, what do you want with you, sir? He wanted me to make up a piece of machinery for him. He said it was a special part of a new gadget he was working on. He brought in his own drawing of the thing. I got it down here someplace. Let's see. Well, what did the young fellow look like? Would you remember that? No, oh, typical pool room cowboy, I guess. About 29, 30 years old. Thin side, tall. Got a lot of gray hair for a young fella. Hair was almost gray. Here's the drawing. This is what he wants me to make up for him. Hmm. What do you figure it's supposed to be? Miss McKinley said it was part of a new hydraulic press he's working on. I got a few doubts about that. How do you mean? Oh, I've been tinkering around in this business long enough to know what goes into a hydraulic press. Can't see where this thing fits in at all. Well, what's your idea on it? I think it's a pull. Only one job they're any good for. Yeah. Breaking into a safe. Before we left the fix-it shop, Van Owen gave us a complete description of Ralph McKinley, the man who'd ordered the gadget made for him. We showed him several mug shots of possible suspects, but he was unable to make any identification. Van Owen told us that McKinley said he'd call back in about three or four days to pick it up. Except for the man's chance remark that he lived in the neighborhood, Van Owen had no idea as to his whereabouts. 12.10 p.m. We drove back to the office and made arrangements for an immediate stakeout at the fix-it shop. Then we checked the name and description of Ralph McKinley through R&I and through the stats office. It got us nothing. As far as we could find out, he had no previous criminal record. The end of the week came and went. The man known as McKinley failed to show up at Van Owen's fix-it shop to pick up the article that he'd ordered. 8 o'clock Monday morning, June 28th. We got the report when we checked in for work. Despite all precautions, another safe job had occurred over the weekend, this time at a liquor store on South Alvarado. The time, the area, and the M.O. were generally the same. Frank and I drove out to the location. The store was located in the middle of the block, directly beneath an apartment hotel. Two of the rooms on the second floor of the hotel were situated above the liquor store. In one of these rooms, a hole had been ripped in the floor, a hole large enough to allow a man to pass through it and gain access to the liquor store directly beneath. After we checked over the room, we put in a call for Ray Pinker and the crime lab crew. Then we went downstairs to interview the manager of the hotel, a Clyde Winters. Yeah, I, uh, I rented that room Friday night. A couple of young fellows had checked in a few minutes before 7. I, uh, I figure I'm a pretty good judge of faces. They sure didn't look like thieves to me. How'd they register, Mr. Winters? Well, one signed his name was Gordon. The other one was... Uh, Richardson, I think. Uh, the register's right outside on the desk. You can check it if you like. Yes, sir, we'd like to do that. When these two men, Gordon and Richardson, checked in here, did they have any baggage with them? Would you know that? Oh, yes, yes, they had baggage. They they took most of it with them, though. They left a few old clothes behind. They must have left for the back way oh, sometime late Sunday night, I figure. Imagine tearing up the floor of that room, the lousy bums. I'd sure like to get my hands on them. Did they have a car, do you know? Yeah, they had a car. I got the license number, too. You think you'd recognize the two men if you saw them again? Oh, I'd peg them in a minute. You sure of that, are you? Positive. I, I'd know him in a minute, especially the young fellow Richardson. He couldn't have been more than 27, 28 years old. Yeah. Hair was gray, almost completely gray. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. To show our confidence in Fatima, we make this money-back guarantee. Buy a pack of Fatimas. Enjoy Fatima quality, extra mildness, and superbly blended tobaccos. If you're not convinced Fatima is better than the king-size cigarette you're now smoking, just return the pack and the unsmoked Fatimas by August 1st, 1952, for your money back plus postage. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Prove Fatima quality yourself. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One. Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. Fatima gives you more for your money. And in king-size Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Ask your dealer for Fatima in the bright sunny yellow pack. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Monday, June 28th, 8.55 a.m. 
The crime lab crew arrived at the scene of the latest safe burglary, the liquor store on South Alvarado, and began their investigation. The store was gone over thoroughly, as well as the hotel room directly above it through which the burglars had gained access by ripping a hole in the floor. In the store itself, a few feet from the safe, the men from the crime lab found what appeared to be a broken button, probably off a coat. They also found a crumpled envelope on the floor with the name F. Gordon on it, written in pencil. Along with the half a dozen pieces of clothing found in the hotel room, the items were taken back to the crime lab for further examination. 9, 10 a.m. After we finished interviewing the hotel manager, Clyde Winters, Frank Smith and I returned to the office with a license number and description of the suspect's car, as well as exemplars of their handwriting, which we'd obtained from the hotel register. We gave our DMV all the information on the car, and they began an immediate check. The vehicle was registered in the name of Ralph McKinley at a Bronson Avenue address. The legal owner was a local bank. We checked the Bronson Avenue place, but they told us there that the man known as McKinley had moved out seven months before. They had no information on his whereabouts. 10.20 a.m. We talked to the people at the bank which held the pink slip on the car. They told us that the last two monthly payments on the car had been mailed in from a Clifford Street address. Frank and I drove out to the location, a one-story duplex apartment building near the intersection of Clifford and Beverly Boulevard. Nice units, aren't they? Yeah. Going up all over town. They seem to be, don't they? I'll get it. All right. Yeah? Your name, Ralph McKinley? Yeah, that's right. What you... Police officers, you want to get your coat, McKinley? like to talk to you downtown. What for? What's it all about? Anybody else living here with you? No, just myself. Look, you mind telling me what this is all about? Got a few questions we'd like to ask. It won't take long. I can't go with you now. I got a business appointment, half an hour. I've been out of town the last couple of months. I'm, I'm due back on a job today. That's so? Yeah, I just can't spare the time. Appointments all day long. I got a whole flock of business I have to clear up. Well, that makes us even. Come on, let's go. Well, there wasn't much doubt about McKinley. He fitted the suspect's description almost perfectly. Tall, slight build, approximately 29 years of age, prematurely gray hair. We went over the apartment, but there was no sign of anyone else on the premises. No sign of any of the loot taken in the burglaries. We checked the adjoining garage, but it was empty. The suspect refused to admit that he even owned a car. Frank got on the phone, called the office, and arranged for an immediate stakeout on the apartment. When the men arrived, we drove McKinley back to the city hall and took him to the interrogation room. He was arrogant and uncooperative. We talked to him for a full hour, but he'd admit nothing. Frank left and went down the street to the crime lab to check with Ray Pinker on his findings. I continued questioning McKinley. I don't care what the old man says. I don't know what you're talking about. He described you perfectly. He says you were in his fix-it shop a little over a week ago. You told him you were an inventor. You ordered this gadget from him here. I don't get it. What's that supposed to prove? Well, you admit you went to the old man. You had to make this thing up for you, didn't you? I don't admit anything. Why should I? All we're looking for is a straight story. We're going to get it sooner or later, McKinley. Might as well be now. You're getting nothing from me. I don't have to tell you a thing. How about the hotel over on South Alvarado? You stayed there last weekend? No, of course not. Why should I go to a hotel? I stayed at my place. Thought you said you'd been away. You just got back in town. Sure, that's what I said. I just got back last week. Well, then you didn't stay at that hotel in South Alabama. I told you I didn't. I don't even know the place. But you know Mr. Van O and the old fellow at the fix-it shop. I don't know him either. I don't even go near that end of town. What end of town? What are you talking about? Where you said the shop is? I didn't mention where it was. I asked you if you knew a Mr. Van Owen, if you ever went to his fix-it shop to order anything. Look, what are you lying for? What's the angle? No angle, McKinley. I told you I'd like to have a straight story, that's all. Well, you got it, mister. You heard everything I have to say. I don't know any old man. I don't know anything about that hotel. Friday talking. Yeah, Don. How'd it go? Uh-huh. I see. Yeah, we'll pick it up. No, we'll pick it up. Right. Thanks a lot. You don't lie very good, McKinley. Now, what are you talking about? That was our handwriting man. He just finished checking those exemplars of your handwriting we got from you. He compared them to a signature in the register at the hotel on South Alvarado. I already told you. I don't know the place. Young fellow by the name of Richardson checked in there Friday night about 7 o'clock. He signed the register. The signature's in your handwriting, McKinley. Yeah, sure. That's right. I don't know the place. I've never been there. Now, look, you're going to have to do better than that, fella. The hotel manager's on his way down here now to identify you. So's Mr. Van Owen from that fix-it shop. Maybe you better piece together a new story, huh? You got my story, cop. I was out of town. You can't prove I wasn't. All right, McKinley. Any way you want it. Joe? Hi. How'd it go? Pretty good. Ray Pinker finished checking his stuff at the crime lab. Here's a report on it. Thank you. Just about sews it up, no doubt about it. Yeah, you're right. All right, what is it this time? More of your phony charges? I want out of here. Can't be done, McKinley. Report on the clothes found in that hotel room. They're not my clothes. I wasn't even in the place. I'd say you were. Cleaning tags on a pair of trousers, one of the coats. Traced them through the dry cleaners to you. It's a lie. I told you I wasn't in the place. I just something else here, fella. 
They ran tests on all the clothes they found in your room. They found particles of fire clay from the safe that you broke into down below in the liquor store, your coat, your trousers. They were covered with the stuff. Now save your breath, will you? I'm not and when you ripped up the floor of that hotel room, you picked up something else on the clothes, particles of floor varnish, small bits of wood. They all tie in. You through? No, not quite. A piece of broken coat button we picked up a couple of feet from the safe. They matched it up with one of the buttons on your coat, a broken one. The pieces fit perfectly. Kinley, how about it? You've got my story. No, you've got a lot to explain. I'll take my chances. What's the pitch, McKinley? You know you got to come up with a story. It might as well be now. There's no story to it. I was out of town. I told you that. Why don't you get off it, mister? It's not going to take much to make a liar out of you. You know that, don't you? Oh, look, why don't you get off my back, the two of you? I told you everything I'm going to tell you. Sit down, McKinley. I'm getting out of Sit here. Sit down. All right. Go ahead. I can wait it out as long as you can. I doubt that. I'll get it. All right. Smith speaking. How's it? Oh, yeah, Jim. What is it? That right. When? Mm hmm. Fine. Yeah, thanks. Piece of news for you, McKinley. Yeah. Your partner came back to your place a few minutes ago. Our men picked him up. They're bringing him in now. Yeah, that is news to me. I don't have any partner. I'm in business for myself. That's what your partner figures. Tell me he claims you got all the money. He thinks you were trying to run out on him. Oh, what money? Look, I showed you my wallet. You know how much I got. Now, we're going to ask you just once more. You fella. got it. There's nothing else to say. All right, Frank. Yeah, let's book him in. According to Rogers, his partner's willing to talk. We'll get the story from him. All right, McKinley, let's go. What do you mean, go where? Main jail. We're booking you in. Come on, let's go. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah. Come on. What did he say, anyway, this guy you say they picked up? Oh, your partner? Well, we told you what he said. Why? What's the matter? Nothing. I just asked. Better order up a stenographer, huh, Joe? Have it ready to take the statement when they bring the guy in? Yeah, it's a good idea. Sergeant? Yeah. Let's go back, I'll tell you. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 19th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 91, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, just a parting word about Fatima. I know a lot of you have promised yourself that you'd give Fatimas a try, but, well, you just haven't gotten around to it yet. So I'd appreciate it if you'd kind of keep us in mind the next time you buy cigarettes and ask your dealer for Fatimas. You'll find Fatima gives you more for your money. Compare them with any other king-size cigarette, and you'll find Fatima does have a better flavor and aroma. You'll like its extra mild and soothing smoke. Tomorrow, buy Fatima, best of all king-size cigarettes. Ralph Arthur McKinley and his accomplice, John Warren Hatfield, were tried and convicted on six counts of second-degree burglary. They received sentences as prescribed by law. Second-degree burglary is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for not more than one year or by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than one nor more than 15 years. Ladies and gentlemen, to protect our nation and the free world against communist aggression, we must produce vast quantities of guns, planes, tanks, and explosives. Defense of our country against aggression abroad and inflation at home depends on our ability to fill both our military and civilian requirements. Remember, the better we produce, the stronger we grow. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Harry Bartell, Stacy Harris, Jack Crucian. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. There's more adventurous entertainment with Nightbeat next on NBC.